And thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon, uh, taking some time out of your day. Um, as Jody mentioned, uh, the purpose of this webinar and, and as well as some others that we're having over the next couple of weeks is, is to uh, improve some understanding about the UMRR program and some of the things that we do. Uh, so today's presentation is really going to be uh, a, a broad overview. Um, I did that. Sorry about that. The, uh, <clears throat> what I hope to touch on today is a little bit of the origin of where did this, where did this program come from and why. Uh, and also, as well, uh, one of the key components of it is uh, the partnership that we formed uh, to, to, to implement this program. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, really the two primary elements of the program, uh, long-term resource monitoring and habitat rehabilitation and enhancement. Uh, and then touch on uh, some of the initiatives that we have going on as a program, as a partnership, uh, and then uh, just uh, some resources that uh, you can access for further information. And then we can take questions at, at the end. And so I, where I want to start really is, is with, with the vision that we have for the program. And this is, uh, this is a summation of a lot of work of a lot of people over the last several years. Uh, and, it, and it corresponds with a with a document that I'll talk a little bit about later. But really, the the the, the vision that the partnership uh, in the Upper Mississippi River system has is for a healthier and more resilient uh, Upper Mississippi River ecosystem uh, that that sustains and balances all those uses that uh, society has placed on the river system. Uh, and so that's really the the, the starting point for uh, where this program uh, is moving towards. Some other things that I want to emphasize that hopefully come out of the uh, um, this this webinar, um, I, I want to emphasize that you know this is the first large river ecosystem restoration and scientific monitoring program in the nation, uh, dating back over 30 years. Uh, we really set the bar pretty high uh, nationwide for for how to do this, uh, ac accomplish ecosystem restoration, and how to do it well. Um, I hope that it comes across uh, the value of this partnership that I've already mentioned. Uh, it really, uh, that's the reason this program it has been so successful is, is that partnership. Uh, and, the, and, and, uh, and you all, your participation in, in the program. Uh, and then also the value of the program uh, in the integration that we do between science and monitoring and program management and implementing projects on the ground. And then finally, just never losing sight of the fact that we're accomplishing uh, great things uh, in terms of restoration uh, and protection in the third largest river system on the planet. Uh, that's, uh, that's no small task, and uh, we need to keep that in mind. In terms of the origins of the authority, just real briefly, um, you know, the Corps of Engineers' involvement uh, actually goes back to the 1800s, 1870s. Uh, when there was an uh, initial navigation project, a four-foot channel uh, authorized by Congress. That was then followed later on by uh, the nine-foot uh, channel project, uh, which we see today out on the river system for both the Upper Mississippi River and the Illinois Waterway. Uh, a series of locks and dams uh, were constructed to maintain that uh, nine-foot uh, navigability. As those things were happening uh, in the 30s and 40s, uh, there, was, there was a group of, of uh, uh, river managers, river rats, uh, concerned citizens who got together in the, in the mid-40s uh, under the auspices of the Upper Mississippi River Conservation Committee. And that, that organization actually just uh, celebrated its 75th anniversary. And, th and those folks in that forum and that discussion uh, has played a pretty important role in uh, you know, how we got to this authority and how we uh, view and manage the Upper Mississippi River system. Uh, and so throughout the, through the end of the 60s and into the 1970s, uh, the nation, society began to uh, recognize the environmental degradation that's been occurring, uh, not just here but elsewhere in the country. And, and for the Upper Miss in particular, that resulted in uh, what we call uh, some investigations, what we call the great studies. And those really began to start to dive into some of these issues, these, uh, you know, these conflicts between the multiple uses that we expect uh, uh, from the river. 
And that ultimately resulted in a, a master plan that was completed for the Upper Miss in 1982 uh, by the Upper Mississippi River Basin Commission, uh, which is now uh, uh, the Upper Mississippi River Basin Association, UMRBA, uh, one of our partners. Uh, that really set the stage. It, lay, it made the case to Congress for this authority, uh, the Upper Miss Restoration Authority, uh, which we saw come to fruition in 1986, uh, the Water Resources Development Act, which authorized this program, uh, as well as uh, giving the Corps of Engineers uh, its third primary mission of, of ecosystem restoration. And since then, uh, that, that mission has, has developed and evolved within the Corps of Engineers and, and within other agencies. Uh, we, we saw in, in 2007, uh, with the authorization of the Navigation and Ecosystem Sustainability Program, a recognition that uh, those uh, navigation and ecosystem uh, could be integrated into a single construction authority. Uh, and then more recently, uh, within the program itself, uh, the partnership has worked pretty hard to develop a, a strategic plan uh, for the next uh, for the next decade, uh, going out to 2025, to guide the program and guide our uh, efforts. Just to touch on a, on a couple of key concepts and and why this authority exists. Um, obviously, we have a, a navigation system uh, that's been operating for quite some time on the Upper Miss, both on the, on the Mississippi River and the Illinois Waterway. Uh, in, in terms of uh, goods, and goods that are shipped on this system, this is, uh, depending on the year, the second or the third busiest inland navigation system uh, in the country uh, in, in excess of uh, 68 million tons uh, per year moving on the system. But it also supports really one of the, one of the most diverse ecosystems uh, on the planet uh, for both both fish and wildlife species uh, of all kinds. Uh, it also supports uh, a, a very large population, almost 30 million people, uh, providing recreation opportunities uh, for those citizens as well as uh, clean water, uh, potable water for a number of, of communities. Uh, we have some significant designations on, from, on an international scale. Uh, the Ramsar uh, Wetlands Convention has recognized a good deal of the Upper Miss uh, as, as, as critical habitat. <clears throat> and so these two competing, uh, not competing, but these two uh, uses, uh, if you will, uh, really began to, sorry about that. Having trouble with the slides here. The, uh, uh, as I mentioned a little bit ago, through the 60s and 70s, we began to understand some of the uh, repercussions and implications of, of the demands that we placed on the system uh, from a navigation standpoint. We started to see some some changes in the system as a result of that navigation system, but then also other things. Uh, obviously, navigation. If you see on this slide here. Uh, an example from Pool 8, uh, in the 1890s we had a lot, uh, a lot of floodplain wetland habitats, forested habitats uh, that when we uh, impounded uh, the pools uh, for navigation, uh, we, we submerged a good deal of those, those habitats and, and turned them into a, a more lake-like environment. We also have issues, uh, problems in the system uh, related to invasive species erosion and sedimentation on the landscape that contributes to excessive sediment load in the, in the main stem of the rivers, but then also we have erosion and sedimentation problems with our island complexes and some of our side channel complexes. And so overall, the objective of the program is, is really to begin to address some of those stressors on the system. Some further examples you can see here uh, in the upper impounded reach uh, of the Mississippi River at Pool 9. Just some comparisons there uh, from from the late 1800s to uh, 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 the late late 1980s. You can see that change in uh, the landscape there. Uh, moving further downriver into Pool 24, you you see those similar types of uh, changes in in the, the amount of surface water 
as well as changes in the in the floodplain landscape from habitat to uh, a more agricultural culturally dominated uh, system. Uh, on the upper Illinois, uh, this is uh, near Henry, Illinois. Uh, actually, the image on the left is from the uh, uh, Government Land Office surveys in the early 1800s, 1810 time frame, and then what, what we have in 2000. And we have, you know, in some in some places along the Illinois, four to five feet more water than than what was historically there, and so that's dramatically uh, changed the habitat. Uh, in the system, and then uh, back to, further back down, more towards the confluence, the lower river, um, you can see that change in uh, uh, habitat uh, that occurred uh, as a result of these changes in the, the, the land, on the landscape. And so, all of these changes really resulted in. Uh, a good deal of conflict uh, into the late eight, uh, 1960s and early 1970s, particularly around some of our locks and dams where we were looking at uh, large-scale replacement or upgrades to those. And, and that conflict, if you will, uh, really served as a catalyst to begin a series of conversations uh, facilitated by the Upper Mississippi River Basin Commission uh, and others uh, to try and get to a uh, a solution that uh, was sustainable for all the uses that are expected of the river and uh, that, that incorporated a collaborative approach uh, to dealing with uh, uh, these issues. And, and the result of that, uh, to make a long story short, uh, was that, that master plan that I mentioned and in it, it recommended a number of things which ultimately became uh, this authority that we have for the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program which was uh, enacted into law into 1986. And so over 30 years later, we're uh, continuing to implement that program. It's, again, the oldest. Uh, it was the nation's first uh, integrated approach to restoration and science. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about the, the details of that in a moment. And so this program, uh, it covers a pretty broad area. It's a five-state uh, uh, watershed. The, uh, the area in red that you see on the slide is, is essentially the navigable portions of the Upper Miss, uh, the Illinois Waterway, and portions of the Kaskaskia, St. Croix, and Minnesota Rivers. Moving on to the, the partnership that, that uh, is so critical to this program, um, the the partnership formally is composed of the federal agencies that you see here as well as the five states, uh, but we also have very active uh, participation from our non-governmental -gover organization community as well as um, individual communities up and down the river uh, as well as other uh, the, the general public. And I just wanted to t highlight a couple of things in regards to the partnership. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of groups that I wanted to highlight. The first is the, uh, the Upper Miss uh, Restoration Program Coordinating Committee. Uh, this is a group that meets quarterly and, and provides oversight to this program. Uh, it's co-chaired by the Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And as you can see there, we, we have memberships from the states uh, as well as other federal agencies. And the, the UMRBA, Upper Mississippi River Basin Association, is also a part of that. And they also serve as a, uh, kind of a unique role as a facilitator and, and um, support for that group. Um, there's also uh, what we call the analysis teams, which kind of serves as a technical advisory group to the coordinating committee. Uh, they provide feedback on a number of topics uh, related to, to, uh, to science and, and, and monitoring. We also have, uh, and you may be familiar with, with some of these in, in, in your own parts of the world, uh, we have up and down the river system, we have what we call the regional river teams. Uh, and they generally correspond to the geographic uh, areas of the, the, the Corps of Engineers districts. Uh, but these are really uh, uh, groups where uh, the river resource managers, the folks who work with, on the river and, and, and with the public on a regular basis, uh, come together to exchange ideas and, and uh, provide some guidance uh, to the program. 
Everybody likes a good organizational chart, so I threw this one in there. Uh, this is kind of the whole, how the whole program fits together um, with, with some of those groups that I talked about just a moment ago. Um, un underneath the whole program, uh, the, the, the uh, coordinating committee provides that oversight. And then within the long-term resource monitoring and the habitat rehabilitation enhancement projects, you can kind of see where um, some of the supporting uh, partnerships are, are uh, where they feed into. Uh, th those uh, river teams that I just mentioned are there on the bottom right. And then uh, uh, the long-term resource monitoring uh, element of the program, I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Uh, but we have uh, field stations uh, spread across six, five states, uh, six locations uh, around the river. And so some of the things that the partners uh, are involved in, um, we have a lot of public participation in this program, public meetings, tours, opportunities to get feedback from the public. And, and, and so our formal partners uh, spend a lot of time and, and uh, help us out quite a bit in uh, hosting those types of events, uh, providing uh, content for those uh, engagements with the public, and, and really uh, the states a lot of times are, are, are a lot more, uh, the state staff and, and, and other folks are a lot more, uh, have more frequent opportunities to interact with the public than say maybe some of the core folks do uh, or, or, or the service does. Um, our partners are also actively engaged in the teams that develop habitat rehabilitation enhancement projects. Uh, the core, uh, the federal agencies just don't go off uh, and do these in a vacuum. Uh, we have uh, folks from the states and, and, and those partnering agencies actively part of the teams uh, to develop those, those projects. And then also when we get into construction uh, of, of uh, habitat projects, uh, our partners are oftentimes uh, having interactions with, with the contractors uh, as well as local uh, uh, interested parties. I want to move now to the, to the long-term resource monitoring uh, component of the, the program. LTRM really has uh, two, two broad uh, missions. One is, is, is um, systemic monitoring of the system. Uh, that's composed of, uh, you, you can see, I mentioned earlier we, had, uh, we have six field stations uh, up and down the river. Um, that that uh, monitoring that they do is, is uh, related to the fisheries components, uh, vegetation monitoring as well as water quality. Um, they, the, program, the LTRM element also uh, provides us uh, a pretty robust spatial analysis GIS capability uh, through the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, that was something I neglected to mention earlier on that uh, programmatic slide. LTRM uh, functions and these field stations function uh, in consultation with uh, UMESC at uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, um, Upper Miss Environmental Science Center in, in La Crosse. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're linked into this and I'll uh, touch on their role here in a bit, in a minute. Um, I wanted to tie back, you know, as I said, this program is, is, is the first in the nation to link science and restoration uh, uh, as closely together uh, as we do. And this, this goes back to that master plan that I talked about uh, in, in the where, where did the authority come from. Um, those folks as part of that, those discussions and developing that master plan really uh, laid the groundwork for this, uh, these two elements within the program uh, because, you know, they recognize as a complex river system the problems are not easy to solve, let alone get your mind wrapped around them, and that the lack of information and communication can lead to really challenging uh, management uh, decisions. Uh, not just management decisions, but you know, how do we communicate with the public if we, if we don't have a good set of information? And so the reason LTRM exists is some really uh, good people uh, had the foresight to uh, make sure that this was part of the program from the beginning uh, when it was authorized. So some of the success of the achievements of the program over the last uh, 30 years, as I said, we have six uh, study reaches, six field stations 
uh, spanning a, a range of conditions within the, the entire system. Uh, we've developed standardized uh, design uh, study methodology uh, that not only has uh, served this program well, but we have been, you know, we, we are constantly getting requests uh, from around the Midwest uh, to share that, uh, those methodologies and standards uh, with others who have then adopted those and, and used those protocols uh, for their own uh, monitoring activities. Uh, we have in one place uh, and I'll, I'll put a link up here uh, in a little bit, but we have in one place all of this information uh, is, is available um, in, in a relatively easy uh, format to access. You can get raw data, you can get summarized data, you can get uh, graphical interpretations. All this is available through the USGS website, and I'll show you the, that in a minute. Um, we have a long-term, we're making a long-term investment in research projects that help understand the system better and also help inform the, the management or the, the habitat restoration projects that we're putting on the ground. And then finally, uh, the, the, the partnership that I keep coming back to, uh, these field stations are state supported. Uh, state staff uh, does this monitoring uh, on behalf of the program and in consultation with the USGS and the Corps and the rest of the partnership. And so we're leveraging a tremendous amount of expertise and a tremendous amount of uh, uh, staff uh, to, to get this to happen. So we're, uh, uh, this is something we're very proud of as a program. Just so you get a little bit of an idea of the roles, obviously the core, uh, because the, the, the dollars and the, the authority, you know, kind of flow through us. We have a responsibility to facilitate that partnership uh, and, and work with, with, with the partners in the program. We also uh, are kind of the pointy end of the stick when it comes to dealing with uh, the administration, uh, Office of Management and Budget, and Congress for funding. So we put together the budget packages for the program. Um, and then in a, in a broad sense, we try to provide uh, overall leadership and management and ultimately accountability to Congress for the things that are getting done. And then finally, uh, we obviously have a role in communicating to the public uh, and other stakeholders uh, the value of the program. As I mentioned a moment ago, uh, USGS uh, through uh, UMESC, the Science Center, uh, really provides key leadership uh, in terms of the science uh, component of this, this program. Uh, it's their role to provide leadership to ensure that the base monitoring, the, the, the base package of, of, of things that we do every year to monitor the system, uh, that those things are operated efficiently and effectively. And then uh, they also uh, assist in leading, uh, they also lead the development of the research needs for the program, uh, as well as putting together uh, with the Corps of Engineers the, and the states the, the scope of work uh, that we uh, execute annually. And then finally, the field stations. Uh, this is where the work is being done uh, to gather and collect that data and, and uh, uh, help us understand what's been changing over 30 years and, and what, what, are, what are the improvements that we, we are seeing as a result of our uh, restoration projects, but then also what are we seeing at a system level uh, that can help us uh, make decisions as we go forward. And so they're involved in uh, development of that scope of work on an annual basis conducting that uh, routine uh, monitoring of the system, uh, and then they also have supporting roles in terms of research. Both of these, uh, just like the core uh, communications is, 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 is pretty key. Uh, in fact, some of our field station folks uh, interact with the public way more than, than uh, uh, some of us do here back at the office uh, because they're out on the river every day, and so they see uh, they, see, they see and interact with the users and they get a lot of questions. So communication is, very, is a key role for them. As I said, all of this information uh, that we've been collecting for 32 and a half years is available at the, uh, 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 the USGS website at the, at the Upper Midwest Environmental Sciences Center. Uh, you, you can access everything that we have related to these topics that you see here. Moving on to the habitat rehabilitation enhancement side, um, the, uh, 
the implementation of, of, of HREP projects uh, takes many different forms. Uh, we have a lot of different tools that we use uh, to achieve habitat restoration, whether that be island building uh, or island protection. Uh, in a lot of cases we have islands that are uh, experiencing erosion. Uh, so we do some uh, quite a bit of island protection. Uh, we work with uh, uh, the forestry community to uh, improve some of our uh, floodplain forest habitat uh, that we have an abundance of in the system. Uh, we do a lot of projects related to overwintering fish habitat, uh, restoring some of that depth of diversity that's been lost due to the excessive sedimentation within the system. Uh, some other things uh, also include uh, moist soil management units where an area is uh, off the main channel uh, and, and the, uh, the water levels don't function in a way that supports good quality habitat, uh, whether that be food and refuge resources for waterfowl or uh, submerged aquatic vegetation uh, for the aquatic communities. Uh, and, and so in some, some projects we uh, uh, work on the landscape to manipulate those water levels in a, in a way that, that supports those habitats that have uh, been negatively impacted. Just to give you a, an overview of, of kind of what's going on right now in each of the three districts uh, up, up geographically, uh, up in St. Paul, we have a number of projects that are in the planning stages uh, at McGregor Lake and Bass Ponds. Uh, those two projects are actually looking to complete feasibility uh, reports this year and then move into design and construction. Uh, Lower Pool 10 is a project that got started here just a little bit ago, so that team is working uh, with, uh, working to uh, develop uh, different alternatives. And then uh, we have a project at Reno Bottoms that's, that's just getting started. In terms of design, as I mentioned, McGregor Lake and Bass Ponds, uh, once those feasibility studies are completed, we would move into uh, design. Uh, and then on the construction side, we have a couple of projects, uh, Harper Slough and Conway Lake, uh, that are uh, active. Uh, Harper Slough is, is, is just finishing up. There's a few, uh, some repairs due to some flooding that, that, that are being done this year. And then uh, Conway Lake's the, the active construction project, um, which will be going on for several years, and then uh, McGregor Lake and Bass Pines. Something that I, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, but uh, I want to emphasize, uh, and it's kind of related to partnerships, uh, it is related to partnerships, all of these projects, these habitat restoration projects, all of these have a sponsor. Uh, someone who has come alongside the Corps of Engineers uh, as a partner to plan, design, and construct these projects. Uh, over the last 30 years, we have had sponsorship from each of the states on various projects. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as, as steward of a good many of the acres that are in the upper Mississippi River system as part of the National Wildlife Refuge, uh, has sponsored uh, all, probably about 70 percent of these restoration projects. And I'll show you. Um, a map here at the end of, of all those uh, all those projects. Um, those sponsors are a critical component to getting these projects done uh, from start to finish, from from the initial concept of hey, where do we go do do a project to uh, all the way through construction. And so their role is is pretty key in this, and uh, they are uh, part of the team from start to finish. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that, that lower pool 10 HREP in, in, in St. Paul, um, they're, they're just getting started on uh, identifying you know, problems and opportunities. What, what's, the, what's the intent of this restoration project going to be? Uh, what are we going to go after? And uh, they're just starting the, uh, to look at you know, different types of, of management activities, some of those things I talked about on that first slide, different ways of uh, improving uh, habitat. In Rock Island uh, District's uh, area of responsibility, uh, we have several, three projects in, in, in the feasibility stage right now, the planning stage, uh, Steamboat Island, uh, which is pretty close to having a, a, a 
tentatively selected plan identified. Uh, we've, we've worked through uh, with the states and with the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, who's the sponsor on that project, and I, I think we're getting uh, pretty close to having a, a tentatively selected plan. So we're going to start putting that report together, uh, finishing that report, uh, and getting it ready for uh, our own internal review uh, at our division office. Lower Pool 13 uh, is a project that we just got kicked off here last fall. And, and this one I want to mention real quick, uh, one of the management techniques that we're kind of starting to figure our way through is uh, water level management at the pool scale. Um, we've done this at specific project sites before, uh, but this, at this project the team is actually looking at uh, are, are there alterations we could make to how we operate the, lo the, the dam that controls that pool for environmental benefit. And so that's one, I think this is one of the first, this is the first time uh, an HREP project has, has tackled that, so we're going to be learning a lot from that experience. And then Green Island is just getting started. We, we haven't even put together a team yet. It's just get, getting uh, off the ground. So a couple projects in design. Uh, Beaver Island, that, that contract was actually awarded in, in, in December, and so uh, that's moving through construction. And then at Keysburg, we have a, uh, a first stage of that project, uh, a spillway uh, for some water, water level management uh, at the site uh, that we expect to award in, in August of, of this year. Oops, I did it again. Two other projects that we have in, or excuse me, three other projects that we have in construction. Pool 12, uh, we, we expect to, to wrap up in uh, October of this year. That's been in construction now for about four years. Uh, here on island uh, as well is, is well into construction and, and we hope to have that completed uh, in 2020, the total project. Beaver Island is our newest construction start. We got that going in December of this year, so the contractor has been out uh, preparing the site, getting ready to do some, some dredging. We've had some issues with, with high water uh, that has delayed that. Oh yes, uh, here on island is also uh, in construction right now and expected to be completed in uh, 2020. St. Louis District, uh, a number of projects uh, in, in the feasibility stage, riprap landing. Um, Piasaw and Eagle's Nest has actually completed feasibility and they've moved into the design phase. And uh, Harlow Island is uh, getting close to completing a feasibility report this year. Uh, the Oakwood Bottoms team is, is continuing to make progress. And the, uh, the newest project that will be starting feasibility is Yorkie Nut Slough. Uh, in design, uh, and these are supporting some active construction uh, efforts, uh, Clarence Cannon, which is in construction, the uh, 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 next stage of that is, is uh, in, the, in design right now, and then uh, the Cranes Open River Island project, uh, hoping for a contract award uh, at the end of the, this year. Uh, two projects that are uh, in construction right now, Ted Shanks, uh, in Missouri uh, has actually been completed. Uh, I'll show you a slide here in a second. Um, and Clarence Cannon is, 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 is the big effort right now, uh, multiple contracts uh, related to uh, improving uh, how that site functions in terms of water availability uh, to support habitat. Here's just, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Ted Shanks project uh, was finished earlier uh, this year, and as I said, it's uh, that project is really uh, looking at naturalizing some of those water uh, water exchanges that are happening on the site uh, through, by manipulating uh, the water through some control structures and drainage uh, channels. So, in 32 years, what have we been able to accomplish? Uh, on the on the HREP side, uh, 56 projects have been completed uh, in construction, almost 106,000 acres of, of restoration. 
uh, and we have right now uh, 17 projects that are in various stages of planning and design. This represents, uh, actually over the last decade or so, this represents over half of the wetland acres that have been restored in the United States. Not the Upper Miss, not the Mississippi River Basin, but the entire country. So this program is uh, really at, at the forefront of uh, habitat restoration in the nation, not just in, in, in our part of the world. I want to do, uh, move on and, and touch on some of the, the major program initi initiatives that we have uh, ongoing within the program that support both uh, long-term resource monitoring and habitat rehabilitation and enhancement. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, way back at the beginning when I talked about the vision, uh, one of the, uh, where that came from was a, 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 an intentional effort by our partners uh, and, and this program to develop a, a strategic plan for how we're going to uh, move forward uh, over the next decade or so. And so in 2015, uh, the partnership developed this uh, strategic plan to guide that, uh, guide the program out into the future. Uh, you can see the goals there, uh, enhancing habitat uh, for storing and maintaining a healthier and more resilient uh, upper Mississippi River system. Uh, advancing the knowledge uh, to accomplish that restoration, um, a, a focus on uh, engaging and collaborating with others. Uh, we do have a strong partnership, uh, an active partnership, and it works very well, but we, they recognize that there's opportunities to engage uh, others in that, in that discussion uh, about the future of the system. And then uh, continuing to utilize that strong uh, partnership that w has been developed over the last uh, 30 years. One of the uh, things that we do on a, a fairly regular basis is, is, is produce a report uh, in collaboration with the USGS on the status and trends of the system. Uh, it's it, it kind of in one place we, we, we document uh, the changes of the river uh, ecosystem over time. It helps us uh, document some of the uh, improvements uh, to the design. Uh, of projects, uh, and it also uh, summarizes uh, some of the things that we've learned about the effectiveness of those efforts over time. We're scheduled to update that document here in 2020, and so there's a lot of discussion ongoing about uh, the scope for that and, and uh, moving forward with that effort. So that'll be something that'll be coming out uh, shortly. You know, I mentioned earlier we have uh, 56 projects that we've completed over 32 years. We have learned a heck of a lot about uh, all those different management uh, features that we've implemented over that time. Uh, not only do we do the, the, the physical monitoring of those projects after they've been completed, but uh, we also do some uh, uh, response monitoring of, of, of the fish and aquatic habitat and wildlife that are using those resources. And what we've uh, tried to do over the last uh, decade and a half is to document those all in one place so that w the program, which is operated across a, a vast area and a vast number of partners and, and of course we're always having new people come on board, uh, folks retire, those sorts of things. We wanted to document all those lessons that we've learned from uh, building these projects over 30 years. And so we have an environmental design handbook uh, that does that. It breaks those uh, by, by, by project feature. Uh, we've got a chapter on each of the different types of restoration techniques that we use and the things that we've learned from uh, implementing those over 30 years. So this is a great resource. You can get it on, our, uh, on the program's webpage, which I'll have a link up here in a minute. Uh, but this is a tremendous resource. Uh, we, we've gotten a lot of interest from this around the country because it's, it's truly a, a comprehensive uh, look at large river restoration and there's, there's applicability uh, elsewhere in the country and, and we've had lots of folks interested in that. Every uh, six years, and, and this is required under our authority, uh, we prepare a report to Congress. Uh, and this is where we kind of document uh, 
the progress that's been made in terms of restoration uh, along the river. We summarize the uh, uh, the science and monitoring, uh, what it's what it's telling us in that time frame, and and these reports also really serve as a vehicle to communicate to Congress. Well, here's what, here's what our needs are. Um, you know, we had an authority given to us in 1986. Well, that that authority, that law has actually been changed numerous times, uh, giving us more capability, more flexibility, uh, in some cases, more dollars to work with. And, and these documents really serve as uh, the way we can communicate that with Congress. And so they're, pr they're pretty important. Um, our next scheduled uh, report to Congress is due in 2022. And so we're going to uh, probably over the next 10 months or so start to be thinking about what that's going to look like and the, and the kind of messages that we want to convey to Congress. Another effort that we have had ongoing for a little while is um, an ecological resilience assessment for the Upper Miss system. Um, you know, at, at the most basic level, you know, what is the ecological resilience? Uh, it's, it's the capacity of, of this system to absorb disturbances, whether that be climate change, floods, uh, uh, all sorts of things. And, 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 and does that system still, in spite of those disturbances, retain essentially uh, the, the same function, structure, uh, uh, characteristics uh, that, that uh, make it such a productive uh, ecosystem. And, and so the purpose for us, uh, for the UMRS, is, is really to help us uh, to improve our understanding. Where, where do we stand right now in terms of resiliency? There's a number of, uh, of indicators of resilience that have been developed over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, where do we stand now currently with the system, and then how can that we can use that information to, to, to inform our management and restoration actions in the future? Um, as I just said, we, we, we've, we've worked to identify those indicators, and I'll have a citation for a report here if you're interested in those that you can get to. Uh, and then also, um, this can help us once we, now that we've identified these indicators of resilience, we can start to uh, understand better the, the impacts of our management and our restoration activities on, on those resilience uh, indicators. Something that we uh, just uh, completed here in December of, of last year uh, in terms of the documents themselves is the Habitat Needs Assessment uh, 2. Uh, this was required of us, uh, identified uh, back in the mid-90s. Uh, as, as an opportunity to better understand wh what are the habitat needs uh, within the system as a whole. Uh, we are, the first of these was completed in, t in uh, 2000, uh, and it identified uh, the historic and existing uh, conditions for the system um, and laid out some objectives that we really used uh, quite well to, to, to guide our uh, investments in habitat restoration. Uh, the, the program undertook in 2016 an update to that habitat needs assessment, uh, the HNA2 as we call it, and its purpose uh, in addition to updating what was done uh, in 2000, but uh, it was also uh, it, and is being used to inform how we think about uh, the next generation of HREP projects, uh, and I'll talk about that here, here in a moment. That effort, the Habitat Needs Assessment 2, is actually uh, two documents. Uh, the one on the left there, Indicators of Ecosystem Structure and Function for the Upper Mississippi River System. That really outlines those indicators that I talked about a minute ago. Uh, what are the things that, are, uh, that we want to uh, keep an eye on in terms of the system's uh, overall health uh, and resilience? That then led into the document you see on the right, uh, the Habitat Needs Assessment 2, linking science to management perspectives. This is really where uh, the, uh, those river teams that I talked about um, back in the beginning in terms of partnership, those groups had a, had a fairly intensive role in, in developing this document, uh, taking those indicators that I just mentioned and, and, and uh, evaluating those uh, for their specific uh, areas of the river and making some recommendations about uh, some desired future conditions. So both of those documents are a wealth of information. Uh, they're pretty foundational to where we're going over the next decade. 
Uh, you can see the links there on the right for each of the documents individually. Uh, we also have them up on our program's webpage at the link below. As I mentioned, uh, in relation to that habitat needs assessment, uh, the next generation of habitat rehabilitation enhancement projects. Uh, we have several times during the history of the program uh, looked at opportunities uh, across the system and identified projects that uh, we've, we've planned, designed, and built over time. And we've come to that place again uh, in the program's uh, execution where we need to look forward and start thinking about what those next set of projects might look like. And so we have a, uh, a planning and sequencing framework that is, is guiding that, that process with the goals uh, that you see here. Um, one that I want to focus in on is, is uh, uh, in addition to making the right decisions about where to do restoration, uh, we also want to do it in a way that uh, is transparent and helps the public understand uh, where we're headed. And so the process for identifying those next set of projects, which we were kind of targeted in on uh, 2021 to 2025 for uh, this next set of projects, uh, from June to December of this year, those river teams are going to be engaged in a process to uh, uh, work amongst themselves as, as well as with uh, other partners to develop those uh, potential projects. Uh, they're going to be doing that in a collaborative fashion uh, with those uh, partners and sponsors. And the h and 2 that I just talked about, those indicators that uh, uh, were foundational to that document are really going to be uh, uh, those are going to be considered in the development of the projects uh, and the proposals that, 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 that come out of this process. And there's, going to, there's an expectation that those projects are going to need to uh, address some of those uh, things in the h and 2 The, uh, just wanted to point you towards the, uh, the program webpage uh, that we host here at the Corps of Engineers. This literally has everything uh, we've ever done with the program in a, in a variety of uh, uh, formats. Uh, all of our documents on the individual projects, what we do under LTRM is all here. Uh, upcoming events under our meetings category, you can find information there as well. Really is a wealth of information. Um, for you to tap into. At this time, I'm going to open it up for questions. And folks, if you want <clears throat> to type any questions you may have in the chat, and I will pose them to Marshall. And we are going to take it off of uh, mute all if folks want to um, if folks want to ask questions with your voice instead of your typing. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. All right, so now you guys, uh, if you didn't have your mute on before, uh, you might want to put it on now <laughs> if you're uh, wanting to speak because we can hear you all now. Um, so if, if you want to, please go ahead. If you have a question for Marshall, uh, uh, speak up. Thank you. 
if you guys are in, this is Karen Haggerty. If you're interested in, in anything you heard today on the UMRR website under key documents, there is a wealth of information about all kinds of things that um, the program has been doing and is doing. Um, there's also a link to the LTRM webpage that's hosted by USGS, uh, and there is also a wealth of information there. And if you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. All right. Um, I think we're done for the day. Um, if you want, to, if you didn't get a chance to make your check mark on the organization uh, or state you're from, if you want to do that here um, using your annotation tool, please do that before you um, depart. And then I will show you a quick uh, of what's the list of what's to come. We do have uh, next next week we will have uh, a similar 101 presentation uh, that focuses on our habitat rehabilitation and enhancement projects and programs itself. Um, then on the 30th of, of April, Jeff Hauser will be talking to us about the long-term resource monitoring. And on May 1st, uh, John Hendrickson from the St. Paul District will talk about hydrology and hydraulics modeling that we utilize on the Upper Mississippi River. So thanks for joining and hope to uh, see your name uh, for next week's and the future webinars. Thanks a lot. <laughs>